Luke chapter 15, and I know these are familiar verses, and most of the time, most of the time we deal with uh, the prodigal son, but I just want to deal with the first uh, 10 verses of Scripture this morning and uh, say some things that uh, I hope will help us in, in these days. Uh, Luke chapter 15, verse 1, <clears throat> it says, <clears throat> then, uh, uh, then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear. And the Pharisees and the scribes murmured, saying, This man received the sinners, eateth with him. And he spake this parable unto them, saying, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness, and go after that which is lost until he find it? And when he had found it, he layeth it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends, neighbors, said unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. And I say unto you that likewise, joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth, more than over ninety-nine just persons which need no repentance. Either what woman having ten pieces of silver, she lose one piece, doth not light a candle, sweep the house, seek diligently till she find it. When she had found it, she calleth her friends, her neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I have lost. Likewise, I send you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. Uh, I'm interested in, in verses number four in just a moment. Uh, but I, I thought I, I thought I'd ask the question too before we get started. Anybody in here? Anybody here? And you don't have to need no names, but anybody in here got a dad that's lost without God? Anybody got one? You raise your head. Anybody got a mother that's not saved? Anybody got a a son? Anybody got a daughter that's not saved? Anybody got a a brother or a sister that's not saved? Anybody got a, a friend? Close friend, it's like say. Fellow worker. Thought about one of your in laws that's not saved, or a neighbor, or a grandson, or granddaughter. Every one of us has got at least one. At least one that's lost, I have in my family. There's one. At least one, sometimes more, but at least one. And, and I want to preach this morning on who will go get the one. Who will go get the one? If you'll notice in verses number 4, it says, What man of you having a hundred sheep? If he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety-nine and go and will us, and go after that which is lost until he found it. Now, if you'll notice in these verses of Scripture, it talks about, here's a fellow that's got a hundred sheep. He's got a hundred sheep at one time. But now he's down to ninety-nine. He's lost one. One sheep. And uh, uh, that one sheep, most of the time, it would not have been that important. He could have said, well, I've got 99. Still got 99. What does it matter about the one? What does it matter about that one? We still got the 99 sheep. One, you know, okay, it's gone. We'll let it go. It's not that important. I'll just stay with the 99, take care of the 99, fellowship with the 99. But uh, the Bible talks about here, he, uh, he cares enough for that one sheep that he leaves the rest, pays the price to go and get that one sheep. Amen. And I, I thought about this in this story, that one sheep could have been a lost sinner. We could picture it as a lost sinner. Jesus talks about the sinner that cometh, and he findeth that one, he cometh and rejoice. You know, there's probably that one sinner, that one sinner that, that you've raised your hand about, that son, that daughter, granddaughter, mother, father, that's lost. That one maybe in your family, one in your relationship that's, that's lost. It'd be easy just to say, well, you know, uh, we're saved. And sometimes in our family, we're like that. Uh, we got our, our, our wife, our kids, our husband. We're all saved, so okay, we're all saved going to heaven. But what about that other one? What about that other one in the family is kin to you, that brother, the sister? Sometimes we lose sight of that. Even in the church, it could be less, it could be a lost sinner, but it could be somebody that's 
that's backslid. This, it, it, you could picture that in this chapter because the sheep was in the fold. Right. But it's out of the fold now. And it's out child wandering in the lost. If you go to, to uh, Psalms 119 verse 176, it talks about the sheep has gone astray. And here's the sheep. There may be people that we know of that's been here in the church. There's a part of us. There was a sheep. We had a hundred sheep. One of them's gone now. We're at 99. They're out there. They're saved, but they're out there lost in, in the depths of the world. Sometimes we have a tendency to forget about them. Sometimes we say, well, we've got 150 people. It won't matter if one's gone. We've got 30 families. It won't matter if we lose one family. Amen? But this shepherd, saying it's so important, he thought it's worth going after the one. I, I thought about this in the, the book of Psalms, chapter one, uh, chapter 142. If you remember what the psalmist said, the psalmist looked at that and he cried with a loud voice. And he said, I looked on my right hand, <clears throat> beheld there was no man that would know me. Refuge failed me. No man cared for my soul. Can you imagine that? Here's a man looking for help. Right. Looking left, right, looking for something. And he said, I've come to the conclusion no man cares for my soul. I, I just wonder if that, if that one that you raised your hand about, I wonder if they have that attitude. No man really cares for my soul. If you remember in the book of John, uh, chapter number 7, it talks about the guy that was laying at the, at the pool of Bethesda. And the Bible said when Jesus came and looked at him, you know what he did? He said, uh, why are you still here? You've been here 30, what, well, 38 years. Why are you still here? He said, I have no man when the water is troubled to help me in. I don't have nobody. Seem like nobody cares. I wonder if that one thinks that nobody cares. But here in these verses, I, I thought about Jesus went after the one. Now, now it's great to have a multitude saved. I'd like to have another, uh, uh, James, I'd like to have another Pentecost. <laughs> For 3,000 got saved in one service. Wouldn't that be a blessing? Amen. Wouldn't that be a blessing from one Sunday to the next you're running through 3,000? <laughs> you're talking about being in the pro building program, Brother Doug, get with it. Amen. Can you imagine? Can you imagine how revival, we used to have these revivals, we don't have them now. hundred people get saved. I've seen a hundred people get saved in five nights. Five nights of meetings, a hundred people get saved. Uh, but you know, we don't seem like we don't have that moving like we did. It'd be wonderful if we did. And it seemed like every once in a while it's just one here and one there. Uh, and, but Jesus didn't go after the multitudes. He went after the one. I thought about this in Mark chapter number or John chapter 5 I just talked about it when he went into that place there at that pool of Bethesda you know what there was multitudes laying around there but Jesus went just for that one that one man he spoke to that one man and he said why are you still here he said I have no man with the water's trouble to help me and Jesus looked to him and said rise up and walk Jesus could have took care of the whole multitude but it seemed like he just went for that one. That one. And then I thought about, I thought about uh, in Mark chapter 5, that demon possessed guy. You remember what Jesus did? He's there going down this way. All of a sudden he gets in the ship and he goes across the water. He lands at the graveyard. One man in the graveyard. And he deals with that one man full of the devil. And the Bible says he spoke to him. The devils came out of him. My friend, when it was all over with, he got in the ship, went back across, picked up his ministry, and went on. You know what? He stopped long enough to go, and he cared about that one. He cared about that one enough to go over and, and help him. I, I thought about in, uh, my friend, the Samaritan woman. Jesus said, I must needs go through Samaria. Most people didn't go through Samaria. Most people bypassed Samaria. It was a despised place. Nobody wanted to go through Samaria. Jesus said, I must needs go. And he sent the disciples away, sat down on the well, and waited on one lady. In our day, we'd consider her a harlot. She'd had five husbands. One she was living with wasn't her own. She's shacking up with somebody now. But Jesus went for her. <laughs> and you'll find when he went and got her and chased it, you know what he did? He got in the ship. Or he left again and went back where he was, picked up his ministry and went on. But he took time out of his busy, busy schedule just to get that one. I, I, I thought about 
uh, my friend, in uh, Paul, in the book of Acts, God came down from heaven and spoke in a voice for what one man, it was Paul that was persecuting the church and turned his life around. Thought about Philip. Philip in the book of Acts having a great meeting. People getting healed. Miracles happening. I mean, there's an account meeting, Brother Slick. There's an account meeting. I mean, the glory was falling. Everything was happening. And all of a sudden, God said, Philip, leave this place. And he left that meeting, that great meeting, and went down there and seen a chariot, run down beside that chariot, and asked him, said, understand what thou readest? How can I let some man show me? And my friend Philip stepped up in the chariot, wanted him to Christ, and preached unto one. And my friend, he took time to pull out of all the camp meeting and was busy schedule, ever the blessings going on. He took time to pull out for that one. Huh? It makes me wonder who would go after the one. I thought about this. I thought about this at Crossroads, brother, brother Rocky. Uh, we're close, and, and I work with Crossroads. And, and and we was talking one day, and I said, brother Rocky, I said, there's a lot of people comes through here, and a lot of men come through here. Some stay, some don't stay. And and we was talking about sometimes like now the cold weather. He said, brother Mike, some people can, and when the cold weather comes, he said they come over here at Crossroads. They ain't really want no help. They just want to stay warm and get a free meal. He said, we don't turn them away because he said, each man that comes through crossroads is a potential to reach for Christ. Each man. He didn't say the crowd. He said, each man, each individual man comes in here has a potential to reach him for Christ. He wasn't looking at the whole crowd. He was looking at each individual person who will go after the one. And I thought about this. I thought about this this morning. Uh, give me, I'm going to give you three things about this. And I thought about, first of all, if you're going to go after the one, it takes effort beyond the normal. Right. It takes an effort beyond the normal. See, here's a guy got a hundred sheep. They're out there in the pasture, Brother James. And they're, they're eating, and he's walking along with them, maybe singing some songs, maybe having a good time, whatever shepherds do. And all of a sudden, he realizes one sheep is lost. One sheep's missing. And like I said a while ago, he could have just said, well, it don't matter. It's just one sheep. It's just one sheep. It's just one that uh, I got all this other crowd. And if I go get him, it's going to take a lot of effort. And if you read this, the Bible talks about how my friend, he, he went into the wellness. He left him and went into the wellness after that which was lost. I imagine, I imagine my friend, uh, he, can you imagine as he sits side and looks and said, okay, I appreciate you 99, uh, but I've got to go get this one. The 99 could said, listen, you got 99, don't worry about it. He said, oh no. But you look what you got to go through to get this one. You got to leave the foe. You got to leave the pasture. The green pasture, the waters are flowing. You got to leave all that and go to the wilderness and go through the briars and the thickets. Maybe up the mountain, down the mountain, through the valley. I don't know what all he went through. Good land, vir briars, bris, all kinds of stuff. He had to went through. An extra effort just to get that one. Huh? And you know what? If you reach that one, it's going to take effort beyond the normal. You remember in Mark chapter number 2? You remember what happened in Mark chapter number 2? When the Bible talks about they, uh, Jesus was speaking in this house. house was packed full packed all the way to the door. Four men. An old one guy laying on an old straw tick somewhere. Couldn't get to Jesus. Couldn't help himself. You know what? They went and got him. They went down there and one of them got on each corner. You've heard it preached for years. The brothers think they bore him and carried him. Carried him all the way. They didn't say, if you get up here, Jesus is over yonder and preaching in that house. If you'll get over there, you can get some help. Sometimes that's the way we are. About the only thing we ever do for him is just, you need to go to church, you get some help. Yeah. <laughs> he couldn't go to church. He couldn't go to Jesus. Somebody had to carry him. Right. Somebody had to put some effort, extra effort. They picked him up and carried him over there. When they got there, the doors was full. The doorway was jammed full. The house was full. Jesus on the inside speaking, they couldn't get him in. If that had been most of us, we'd say, well, buddy, I'm sorry. We've done the best we could. We got you as close as we can get you. <laughs> You're on your own, buddy. I guess we'll just have to take you back and put you where you where we found you. 
The door's full. It's packed out. We can't get to him. No, they went up on the top, tore the top off. Tore the roof off. Average Baptist been more worried about putting who's going to pay for fixing the roof than he would Jesus getting him saved. Amen? Can you imagine sitting here some morning and it's, it's, everything starts flying about and here comes a, somebody down? We'd have been the same way. Well, what did they do that for? But they didn't stop. They didn't let nothing head them until they got him to Jesus. It took a lot of effort. They're tired up. And I don't know. They may have put it back together. I don't know what they've done. But what I'm trying to say, they went forth with an extra beyond normal effort to just get that one. Most people said, you think it's worth tearing all that roof off? Just get that one. He ain't worth it. He's sorry. The dope head. Amen. He's wicked. He's done all this stuff. He ain't worth it. But these people thought he was worth going beyond the normal. The shepherd thought it was worth going beyond the normal. Just get that one. You know what we do with our, our loved ones that's lost? Pray for my boys lost. Or pray for my daughter, my mom, my dad. If you ain't careful, I'm just using you for illustration. You said your mom was lost. If you ain't careful, the only thing we'll do, pray for my mom, she's lost. Pray for my mom was lost. Are we willing to go the extra mile? Are we willing, willing to go and do the little effort, extra effort? In the book of Matthew chapter 17, you remember when Jesus was touching and healing and my friend causing people to change their lives. And my friend, you know what the disciples said? They said, Lord, how come we couldn't do this? Jesus was, was touching people. And you remember he was carrying the disciples. He was casting devils out and all kinds of stuff. And they said, Lord, why can't we do this? And they said, this comes from prayer and fasting. In other words, he said, you're going to have to do more than just laying your head on somebody. You're going to have to pray and fast and pray. This is the only way you can reach these is through prayer and fasting. Sometimes the only way we may reach our loved one, that one that you raised your hand about, somebody may have to pray and fast. Do a little extra effort beyond the normal. Amen. I don't mean to be heavy on you, but I guess the Holy Ghost is going to come in heavy on us. But he talks about effort beyond the normal. Uh, going beyond, going that second mile and 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 and, and witnessing to them and and do, I remember, I remember my my son, my oldest son, was going through some hardships and difficulties and things, and and and, and, and the Holy Ghost impressed on me to send him text with Josh, and I'd send him a text every morning. I'd say, "I'm praying for you." Sometimes I'd send him a text, "Jesus loves you," <laughs> and sometimes I'd tell him to send him a verse of scripture, just a little short text every morning, and I'd send him a text, "I'm praying for you." Uh, every day I send him a text. And, and, I, I, and the old devil said, you're wasting your time. He probably ain't even reading them. And God began to work in his heart and his life. You know what? He sent me a text one morning. He said, Daddy, I don't know what you got going on. And I don't know who all you got praying. But just keep it up. It's working. Uh, yeah. And sometimes just a little effort, extra effort of a text or just a, somebody letting you know Jesus loves you. Or send them a verse of scripture. I don't know what it takes, but are we willing to go through the wilderness? Are we willing to get away from the foe and go in a little extra effort? A little extra effort Amen. to get that one. Amen. Just that one. It takes effort beyond normal. It takes love beyond normal. Man, he had to really love that sheep. <laughs> he had to really love that one. Amen. How I many had 99 more to love? <laughs> Takes a lot of love just to love 99. Sure. He loved that one. He loved it enough to, to go after it. Amen. That one that you raised your hand about this morning. That one. That love. Is it willing to have that love? I remember, I remember years ago, and I've got all kinds of illustrations, but I remember years ago, and I've told you this before, in Hartford, Tennessee, the first revival I ever preached, and that's been soon be 56 years ago, I preached, God called me to preach two weeks after God called me to preach, I preached my first revival. It was in this church. They didn't have no piano. Not that they didn't believe in one, they just didn't have one. And they had a tuning fork. We'd sing with a tuning fork. And they'd walk. My car would be the only, church, only car in the parking lot would be my wife. Or my car and all, all everybody else walked. Pastor walked. He lived right above church. And I preached in that church several times. 
I never will forget me and my daddy was up there and they had us for supper one night, this family. And we were sitting there, family, sitting there in the church and, or in their house eating supper. And this lady was pouring her heart out about her son. How he had broke their heart and how he had brought shame on the family and the life he's living and wicked life. And she's sitting there and tears running down her face talking about the trouble and the money that that boy had cost them and the problems that they had went through with that boy. And pouring her heart out about him talking about some of the wicked things that he'd done. And all of a sudden, Sister Brittany, I heard a car pull up. And that mama come up out of her chair. She went in the kitchen and she come back. She, there we forget it. She had a plate. She set it down and put some tea there. And that boy that wicked, that boy that had broke the heart, that boy that had cost them all that money, come walking in. She said, come on, son. Said, we're eating. Said, I got you a place right here. There you go. And I looked at there and I thought, man, oh, her heart's broken. I'm sure there's some hatred in there somewhere. Sure. But love, great love, was manifested to that boy. And he sat right there and talked. And he said, thank you, Mom. And he sat there and he at the table with us. You know what? It went along. That little boy got saved. You know what? She loved him in. She could have said, son, go on in yonder. You can eat later. She could have said, there's a plate in the kitchen. But she put him right in the middle of every bit of us. I thought, man, what love she had among all that she he's doing, amongst all the money that she cost him. That love, what got him. And I'm going to tell you what, it takes a lot of love. It takes a lot of love. I, I, I remember, and I, I've given this illustration before, but I, I feel just it just keeps coming up, and I feel compelled to do this. I remember years ago that Miss Kay, Miss Kay uh, wanted a cat. And she wanted a yellow cat, with white feet. Hey, wasn't a yellow cat with white feet in the county. I called. I called the, what do you call them places, honey? Animal shelters and all that stuff. They had blackens and whitens. You can have one. I don't want a white and a black one. My wife wants a yellow cat with white feet. I never will forget that. Well, they not seen a sign. It's cat free to give away. I got the number and called them. I said, I understand you got a cat giveaway. She said, yes, sir. I said, what color is this? She said, yellow, white feet. I said, where do you live, ma'am? I went and got my boy, and we went down there to her house. And I walked in. I walked in, Brother Josh, and she said, you can have it if you can catch it. <laughs> and I thought, boy, we're in trouble now. And so she said, it's back there in the back room. So me and Kevin, uh, our men went and went back there, told me to catch it and get it. And, and here it went, shoom, right through there to another room. Here she come with the room. She said, I'll help you. I thought, that's what's wrong with it now. Yeah. <laughs> we finally caught that. I told boy, and we caught that cat. And I told that boy, I said, do not turn that loose cat. That's the only cat in the county. It's the only yellow cat, the only white cat, white feet in the county. Do not turn it loose. <laughs> we got that thing home. Walked in the kitchen. I said, okay, here's your cat. That's what I wanted. She, she set it down. This thing said, Choom. It was gone. You could not catch that thing. It was crazy. Wow. Okay, she said, you might as well open the door and let her go. I said, oh, no. Only other cat in the county. We're not letting it go. I told her, I said, I'm going to love that cat. I'm going to catch that cat. I'm going to break that cat. And I'd get down the floor. I know y'all can laugh at this. <laughs> I'd get down the floor with food but slick. And I'd say, Kitty, Kitty, Kitty. I'd lay right flat on the floor. And that cat come look at me. He'd be way back there and look at me. He wouldn't come. I'd pitch the food out there and get back. And he'd come up there and eat. And done that day after day. And I'd go in there and work with that cat. Finally, it got where it'd come a little closer, a little bit closer, and a little bit closer. And finally, it got where, Brother Slick, I could hold my hand out like cat and hold it food in my hand. And he'd eat it out of my hand. If I started to move, he'd kind of back up, but he'd eat out of my hand. And I kept working with him, working with him. I'd lay down on the floor and, and cry and call a catch, you know, and, and woo it and everything. And it got finally where it'd come. He got kind of before we could pet him a little bit and woo him. Next thing you know, the final thing was it got so it got so rotten you couldn't sit down. It was in your lap. <laughs> Purred all over you. I thought, why did we do this for? She said, what happened? We could have thrown him out. We could have hit him with a boom. We could have said no. We loved that old cat to become a great pet. You know what overcome it? Love. Or sometimes we look at our lost loved ones and we look at their lives. All we do, all we see, 
I always say he is dope head. I always say he is wicked, rebellion. I always say he is this or that. Uh, but I tell you what, it's a soul that we can reach for Christ and we love him. Love covers a multitude of sins. My youngest son, and, and I preach so much up here, so if I tell something twice, I've got Alzheimer's, and plus, I just want to say it again. <laughs> I remember my son when he broke our heart, our youngest son. And uh, let me just say, he's doing great now. He's deacon in church, he's got his whole family in church. Amen. What a great thing God done for his life. I remember what he wasn't like that. I remember when I'd drive through town trying to find. I'd find him drunk with James. Never jump on him. I'd just find him drunk, load him in the car and take him to the house. Put him in the shower. Get some coffee on him, made him go to work. <laughs> and we cried and wept and loved on him. Wept and cried, but I remember when he got in trouble and couldn't get him out. And the judge said, Richard, what are we gonna do? I said, All I know to do is I said, You let's put him in jail for seven two hours and take his license away for a year. And that's what they done. And I had to take him down out to jail and put him in. And he got out at 2 o'clock on Saturday. On Sunday. 2 o'clock on Sunday. I was pastored in and I told the church, I said, I won't be here tonight. I said, my boy gets out of jail. They, I'm going to be there when he gets out. I was standing out there by myself in the parking lot. Here come old Kevin out of there. Come right control right toward me, and I'm standing there waiting on him. He told me later, he said, Daddy, I didn't know if he was going to bust me in the mouth. I didn't know if he was going to jump on me. I don't know what he was going to do. He got nearly to me, Josh, and I just took my arms out like that. Hugged that old boy and kissed him. I said, Son. And he looked at me and said, Never again, Daddy. Never again. I said, Let's mean you go somewhere and get us a big old steak. Baked potato and salad and have a good meal. We went in there and I never mentioned nothing. Just took him over and fed him, took him to the house. You know what? Turned his life around. Amen. Amen. Sometimes if nobody don't need a scolding, they just you ever just been to a place you didn't really need a scolding, you just needed a hug. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You just need somebody to say I love you. Good. Is that ain't, ain't that one worth ain't that one worth loving? Yeah. Love then. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Hey, it took it took love beyond normal. It took effort beyond normal. It took determination until he found it. The Bible said he 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 saw it and said he, he stayed with it until he found it, he said. He didn't make an effort, quit. He stayed with it. He found it. Put it on his shoulders. Took it back to the fall. Huh? Sometimes we get all emotional stirred up. And we, we get a little active and then we just quit. I've give up on them. I've give up on them. They just make their own life, make their own choice. I've give up on them. Huh? Don't give up on your mama. Don't give up on them. I, I remember I remember years ago, and I've told you this before. I was preaching the meetings. I preached all the time in this church, like I do here. At a church over in Carnesville, North Carolina. Every time I'd go over, this lady would meet me. And she'd say, Preacher, I hope today's the day. Today's the day my boy's going to get saved. Every time he preached over. Today's the day, Preacher. The pastor told me, said, Preacher, every service, said she'll testify, today's the day my boy's getting saved. Every revival, Brother Seaton go preach a meeting. She'd, he'd say, Brother Mike, that lady, every service, and she says, tonight's the night my boy's going to get saved. This went on for two or three years. I told the pastor one time, I said, has that boy ever come? He said, no. He ain't he'd never been here. I preached a meeting over there. And they were with us on a Wednesday night. And the Holy Spirit told me to preach to the laws. And most time <clears throat> he tried to preach to the church. Because I said, he's going to be there on Wednesday night. And I said, well, this is the church night. This is the, and I've always preached to the church. And the Holy Ghost kept telling me to preach to the laws. Preach to the laws. And now we'll forget that lady coming that night, sit on third row all the time. And she stood up and testified and said, this, is, this may be the night, this may be the night, my boy gets saved. she done that so many times, Brother Slick, people just got used to it. They just throwed it off. Like, oh, Lord. 
Same thing. Say the same thing every service. I know we've got that night I'm preaching. Josh, I'm just preaching away. And I look back there, kind of a glass window going this way. And I seen somebody looking up at her like that. I look at her and I see somebody come up like that. It was so obvious to me because everybody was, you know, their face was toward me. I almost said something. Somebody's at the back door. And the Holy Ghost said, just preach. And I preached. I never will forget that night when I said, bow your heads. I'm through. That door come open. Here come an old ragged boy down that aisle. I didn't know who he was. I never saw him. He come down that aisle. And just as, just as he passed that mom, was just she come unclued. She come out of her and said, I told you, he's here. He's here. That old boy found the altar. They said they were trying to get him saved. You know what she's doing? Running around the hall. Running around the pews. Hall, I told you. I told you. And she run around and shouted and hooped. That old boy got up and got saved. She took another lap. You know what? She determined. She was determined. She kept praying. She kept witnessing. She kept telling. She kept working. And guess what? He got in. Who have you give up on? Don't give up on that one. That one's important. I got a grandbaby. She's what, mama, three year old? Four year old? I know she's not a not to the age of accountability. I don't really know there's age, I think there's a knowledge. But she don't really know because they don't go to church. My oldest son and his wife, they don't go to church. We try to get them to go to church, but they don't go to church. I said I preach right in their door in the back door, try to get them to come and they don't go. I had a little issue after a while back, and I went after him. We were just talking, dealing with some stuff. And, 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 and he, one thing led to another, Brother Bob. And my little old daughter was granddaughter laid on that couch. I looked at my boy. I said, son. And my daughter lost standing there. And I said, I know y'all ain't going to like what I'm fixing to say, and it has nothing to do with what we're doing over here. I said, you see that little baby right there? I said, you're raising her to go to hell. But I said, you don't go to church. You don't read your Bible. You don't know nothing about God. That's my grandbaby. And as far as I know, she won't never hear the gospel because you ain't going to get her under the gospel. Hmm? I got that little old baby, what I whisper in her ear sometimes. I said, I know you don't understand. We call her South Hall. I said, I know you don't understand it's also, but Jesus loves you. Sure, yeah. Papa loves you, and Nana loves you, but Jesus loves you. Right. I want her to hear it. I want her to hear it. I mean, I'll get to hear it at church because they ain't going. But I want to hear it. That's one I want to get to say. I want to tell you what, it takes love beyond measure. It takes a determination. It takes a determination. I remember I remember a lady one time. And don't, don't do this and let God put this on your heart because it won't work. But a lady in the meeting like this, God impressed her to go home and go to the bedroom and stay on her knees and pray till her husband got saved. And she went home. And she told her husband, she said, I'm going back here in the bedroom and I'm going to start praying and I'm not coming out till you get saved. The Holy Ghost impressed her. Don't try it if the Holy Ghost didn't take you. She prayed all day long. The next day, she prayed all night. She prayed the next day all day. Husband come home. Where's supper? She just kept praying. He got him left. <laughs> he come back a little while. Eight or nine o'clock that evening, he left again. <laughs> About midnight, he come back walking in. He said, woman, get up off your knees. I got to get saved. You know what? She prayed and put a little effort. Effort. Now, God told her to do that. Don't do something like that if the Holy Ghost don't tell you. But you know what? She put a little effort, effort, stayed on her knees and prayed over 24 hours. God save her husband. Holy Ghost done his work. As God. What are you talking about, preacher? Ain't that one worth it? I thought about this, and I've got to finish. But I thought about this. Look at the results. Look at the results. He put, he put forth an extra effort. He left the 99. He went through the wilderness. No telling what all he went through. He went to it and he done it because he loved it. You say, how you know he loved it? Because when he found it, he didn't scold it. He didn't whoop it. He picked it up. Put it on his shoulders. 
carried it back. He could have said, he could have got his uh, uh, staff and get back up there to that fellow. Get back up, John. Drove him back. What but he carried and loved him. Carried him back. Huh? Then it talks about how he went up through there. But look in verse number, he said in verse uh, 6, hey, look, at, look at verse 5, and when he has found it, he laid it on his shoulder rejoicing. He said, I'm happy to carry you back. <laughs> I'm thrilled to get to carry you back to the fall. Who's been a part of this church that's not here to now that you'd really rejoice? Most of the time, you know why our attitude is? If they ever come back and visit us, our attitude is, what are they doing here? Yeah. Sometimes our attitude is, somebody leaves, we're better off without them. Well, they could say that about you. If you've got that attitude, you're probably about the same as they are. Yep. True. Huh? Yep. When we see somebody come back in that's been here before, it ought to rejoice. Baby, they're back. Sure. Y'all coming back? Go get them and help them. We love you. We miss you. Carry them back. <laughs> Amen. He rejoiced. And the Bible said he gathered his friends. Rejoice with me for I found the sheep that's lost. I send you likewise joy in heaven. Oh, well, you know what? The results was joy expressed. Can you imagine if whatever it takes, whatever it takes, brother, can you imagine you said your mom was lost? I'm not trying to embarrass you, but can you imagine just work with your mom, invite your mom, pray for your mom, go the extra mile, love her beyond measure? Can you imagine maybe one Sunday you look back there and here comes your mom? Sets back her on the back. Brother Doug gets up and preaches. He gives the invitation. Next thing you know, you look over and here comes your mama. Down the aisle. Here comes your brother. Here comes your sister. Here comes your, your, your dad. Here comes uh, your son, your daughter. Comes walking down that aisle. And they fall down the altar. They stand up and say, I got saved, got born again. Amen. You think we'd sit down and say, well, what about that? No, you'd be like that woman. You'd be making some laughs around just that one. That one. I, I, I'd like to see a whole multitude get saved. Right. I'd like to see 40 people get saved at one day. Wouldn't it good just be that one that, that you know, that one that you've got a burden for? I'm going to tell you, there's nothing or three you anymore. I remember, I remember back in, when I was 16, 17 years old, I was a janitor at the church and uh, took it when I was 16. I'd go up there and sing, shout, I'd sing, shout, and preach, clean church. Yeah, I'd just be a singing and shouting. I've had people there come in and scare me to death. I'd just be singing and shouting. They'd all hey, that's bad. I just told, I thought the devil would come in, you know. I, but I'd go up there and sing and shout and clean the church. I'd clean it at night. Go up there and be at midnight, clean the church. I had an old boy. We had a friend of ours. and We started witnessing to him, telling him about Christ, tried to get him to come to church. I never will forget one Sunday. He came to church. We had a bus route then. That's back at the bus ministry. We had a we had we had a bus that had sixty capacity. We'd have eighty on there. That's back before you had to have all that qualifications, you know, and seat belts. We just pack them in like sardines. We'd visit this old boy and try to get him to come. He wouldn't come. On Sunday, he'd come. Dad preached. I didn't even know he was there. I'm sitting down here, and I didn't know he was there. Daddy preached. Now I'm sitting there, and here comes this guy. He passes me up, and I look up like that. Man, I come out of that seat. It's that old boy. We've been witnessing to and trying to get. He came out and got born again. Man, you talking about happy. And you talking about inside, about to bust. And all it was is that old one, that one, come got birthed in. Can you think about that one? <laughs> that one that you know. You think about him, her. Don't you think it'd be worth it? We do everything we can. I got a little extra, but I'm not going to give all that. You know, we do everything we can to stay away from all this virus, keep kids, family, and everybody away from there. We do everything, and that's, that's a good thing. We do everything we can to protect people. What are we doing to keep them out of hell?
Hmm? I remember, I remember years ago, I probably said this, but I remember years ago I, I preached in Ohio, closed out on Friday night, come right down through here on 75. Drove way up above Cleveland. And I drove in all the way to the house. And I got home, slept three hours. Kate changed my suitcase around, put it in the van. I slept three hours, got up, took a shower, and had breakfast with my family. Got back in the van, left. Drove all, drove all the way to the other side of Tampa, Florida, on that Saturday. I preached Sunday morning, Sunday night, in Tampa, Florida. Monday, I got up and drove to uh, North Carolina all day long. To North Carolina, and I pulled in that church about church time. I came in, and I was so tired, Brother Josh. I was so tired, I couldn't hardly get out of the van. I just so tired. And I came in and I sat down on the front seat. And I was I was just exhausted. I was really exhausted. And one of the men come around and they said, Brother Goodson, why do you do it? I said, Why do I do what? He said, Why do you keep on going and pushing yourself? He said, I know you. He said, You're you you can look at you, you're you're exhausted. I said, I am, brother. I just do, you just do what you do. I preached that night. Give the invitation. Pastor came. I stood down there. Brother Josh, there's a man, grown man, come got saved right here. And his grand grandson got saved right here. And when they got through, the pastor said, What happened to y'all? And they both said they got saved. Before I noted, I stand up on the front seat, wave my Bible. I said, That's why I do it. That's why I do it. There's another, an old sinner needs to be saved. You know why you want to live for God? You know why you want to live clean? Do you know why you want to pray? You know why you want to live for God and study and pray, witness and go and love people and do? Because there's one other sinner, one, just one other sinner. We might get in. I like to shout. I like to run out and have a good time. There ain't nothing. I've seen somebody say. And that one that got saved could be that one that you raised your hand for. Wouldn't it be something if that co-worker got saved? You kept witness to them, inviting them to church, and they come, and you got saved. That friend, that neighbor, mom, dad. Wouldn't it be something? Who will go get to one? Who was willing to go a little bit, uh, effort beyond normal, love beyond normal? Stay with it till you to the determine. Stay with it till you get them. Till you get them in. Get him saved. Did you know that you could receive a daily devotion every morning in your inbox? Head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on Daily Devotions to sign up today. And as always, thanks for listening.